Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to our first of two panels today, Change the System. This one is focused on how we can achieve true systemic change in the quest for gender equality. It's hosted by Nuala Walsh, CEO and founder of Mind Equity Consulting and founding director of the Global Association of Applied Behavioural Scientists. She's also a vice chair of UN Women in the UK, vice chair of the Football Association's Inkton Advisory Board, task force advisor at World Athletics and non-executive director at TS Lombard. So a brilliantly intimidating CV for Nula. So you're in very safe hands. Her panel today includes Kirsty Coventry, a time Olympic medalist for Zimbabwe and now the chair of the IOC's Athletes Commission. She also consults for the Zimbabwe National Olympic Committee and provides motivational talks and clinics for schools and developing athletes around the world. Kelly Fairweather, the Operating Officer for the International Tennis Federation. Kelly has a very varied background across a number of different sports, including significant roles at the International Hockey Federation, the World Anti-Doping Agency and the International Olympic Committee. Ikiru Mitsumasu has over 30 years of experience within the aviation industry and has held multiple leadership roles at Japan Airlines, including his current role as Vice President for Customer Experience and Marketing. Angela Ruggiero, a four-time Olympian and ice hockey medalist, now serving as CEO and co-founder of Sports Innovation Lab, a technology-powered market research firm focused on the intersection of sports and innovation. And last but by no means least, Dr. Eva Voss, the Head of Diversity, Inclusion and People Care at BMP Paribas. Eva is a leader in her field with over 14 years experience and her focus is on unconscious bias, inclusive leadership, the culture of belonging and governance structures of gender equality. So Nula, you're in very esteemed company today and I can't wait to hear what your panellists have to offer to this debate. And on that note, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Catherine, and welcome again to the panel. So, how can we accelerate changing the system, one sport at a time and one step at a time? We've had some great ideas to kick us off from Billie Jean. Show up, stand up, speak up, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So let's get our first guest pretty much uncomfortable. And let's start with you, Kirsty. We've, we've just heard about um, Billie Jean from the hope and I guess the promise of a more balanced future. We know that the Olympics aims towards gender parity and the IOC is ensuring that each nation has one male and one female participant. So let me ask you from an athlete's perspective, how much confidence do you think that the athletes have in achieving uh, this levelling of the field? Hi, Nula, and thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I think as Billie Jean said, and she mentioned it a couple times, that every single person is an influencer, and I very much believe that. Um, I think from an athlete's point of view, the steps that the IOC is taking specifically is um, getting us there. I think it is still going to take time. I think that we are seeing positive change in terms of athlete representation at the Youth Olympic Games and now in Tokyo being equal representation in terms of 50% male, 50% women, everyone being treated exactly the same, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but I still think that there is need for that to now follow through into our national Olympic committees and into our international federations and then down through into our national federations. Um, I think most athletes can see that their organizations are trying, but I think we still have to be very purposeful in the decisions that we are taking towards gender equality. And the more that we can not just speak that, but we can actually show that in the actions and the regulations that we're putting into place, the more confident athletes will have. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Kirsty. Well, if I can just move to, to you, Angela, given your experience, um, you know, with the IOC and different and those different um, national operating committees, um, female representation is still relatively low, exactly as you would see in any FTSE 100 or Fortune 500 company. So although athletes themselves, I think, tend to be pretty gender blind, it's really, you know, some might say it's the sports governing bodies that are that are less blind. Given what you've seen and your and your background, what program exactly have you seen and do you want to see um, both within the, the National Operation Committees and the member federations? Yeah, thanks, Nala. And it, it's great. I get to follow up Kirsty. Um, prior to Kirsty being chair of the Athletes Commission, I was actually chair. So we worked hand in hand and she's done an amazing job. So keep it up, Kirsty. Um, <laughs> 
So she spoke, I think, from the athlete's perspective. Um, when I when I was serving on the IOC, you know, we the actually the athletes commission initiated the gender equality review. And um, to your earlier question, we we think that federations can do more and should be doing more. We do think that uh, the National Olympic Committees and all the member federations. So it's just hard. You can send a recommendation out uh, through that gender equality report. You can't mandate change, unfortunately. I think, uh, but I, you know, I currently serve on the board of World Rugby. We're going through a governance review. Everyone's trying to figure out how do we put more women at the top? Um, how do we ensure equal prize money across sports, across genders? There's a lot of nuances, I, I believe, that it are the responsibility of, of these federations, of these National Olympic Committees. But to your earlier conversation, change is slow sometimes. But once we get there, hopefully it's permanent. Um, you know, the President Bach is an example. I still serve on the Member Nominations Commission, where he has an opportunity to put more women at the IOC membership level through the independent members he's really over indexed on women and said, we want to have more women, make sure we get more women at the table. I would encourage federations to do the same thing. Don't be with the status quo. And the more comfortable we get it with, oh, that's how things have always been done. It's going to be too hard to get to that, uh, that, uh, that new uh, metric you're looking for, you know, change will just be slower. So um, I would encourage all federations, all the leaders out there, everyone's a leader, uh, to really push push the boundaries and don't be comfortable with status quo. Um, you know, while there's been a lot of progress made, so much more can be made. And it really just takes the power of the, the top. And typically those are men uh, that want to stay, uh, I call them ambassadors, that want to be leaders to make change for for women really and uh, and step up when it might be the uncomfortable or unpopular thing. That to me is real leadership. Great. Uh, well, speaking of an ambassador and someone who is in the hot seat, uh, Kelly, let's, let's turn to you. You got some great comments from Billie Jean about you know, tennis being pioneering sport and all that's been done in this space. So given that the title of today is about Advantage All, maybe you could just tell us more what you've done in your tenure, because you've come from rugby, so, or, or sorry, hockey. So what you've done in terms of um, trying to bring all that you've learned to tennis and, be, and accelerate this. So what are you doing in this space and how are you measuring uh, with regard to, to those metrics that Angela was just talking about? Thank you, Nula. L let me just say it's a real pleasure to be with such a high caliber panel and thank, thank you all for making the time to be with us and to share your experiences. I, I will try and just take a couple of minutes to answer your question and share a, uh, a little of the Advantage All journey, if I may. Um, we, we A couple of years ago, we did an ITF Global Tennis Data Report, which showed that half the world's playing population, 40, 47% approximately, are women. Unfortunately, that parity is not reflected in the sports leadership, as we've all known and you know, stated. So we look at the leadership aspect, we look at coaches and officials, and, and, and that's clearly still lacking. This, this story really started at... 20, at the 2017 ITF AGM, and and um, amongst the 113 nations attending, um, Dave Haggerty, uh, ITF president, and myself, we counted 29 women in a sea of almost 200 delegates. And we looked at ourselves, um, at each other, and we said, we have to change this. We, we really need to do something about this. So not only are we working, you know, to change the, in, in the leadership in the, in the tennis governance, but also in the other off-court roles. Currently, only one in five coaches is a woman, and roughly a third of the top-level chair umpires are women. So we have some outstanding women um, in, in, in officiating roles. Our role is essentially the guardian of the game, and it's our responsibility to ensure that is equal opportunity and parents' representation in tennis. And that's clearly one of our strategic priorities. So the following year, we established the project called Advantage All, which is now really taking shape with our five goals. Number one, and this has been said on a number of occasions already, create more opportunities for women to become leaders in our sport, encourage more women and girls to play tennis, female role models, once again, something that's been reiterated on a number of occasions, to inspire the next generation on and off court, increase investment and award equal prize money, 
and also to address and eliminate bias and discrimination at every level. So let me just touch on a few areas, Nula, to highlight what we have done so far to change the system. We've restructured our professional tennis circuits to equalize and earning opportunities. Currently, the ITF senior leadership team are five women and eight men. And the next one I think is really key. We've identified together with the Gender Equality and Tennis Committee and its inspirational chair, Katrina Adams, 120 highly talented women with strong leadership potential from many nations across the globe. And we've implemented a leadership development program to empower and enable these women to reach their potential. We will look at a pathway for progression in the three main areas which I've already stated. Leadership in sports government and administration, attracting more women to pursue off-court careers in officiating and coaching. We've, we feel that creating awareness is so important. So we've, we've provided an education and development resource hub and really are proactive with an awareness campaign to engage our national associations to define their gender equality strategy, strategy and to champion the woman who, who could run for election to board positions. We believe this can only succeed if it's a global effort. Our message to our national, our 210 national association members is equality is not an option, it's a collective obligation. So we're starting to see results in 2020 with concrete signs of lasting change with a measurable increase in the number of women appointed, elected in positions of committees, commissions and board. So Nula, I'll just stop yep. there. I hope that that gives you a quick snapshot of the elements of the Advantage All program. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And if I might just turn to, to Eva now from, from a corporate perspective, I think what you're doing, um, Eva, at, at BNP probably has some echoes of what we've just heard from Kelly. And maybe you can put some put it into context. I mean, banking is a very male dominated industry. I've been many decades there myself. Um, so what is your thing behind the initiatives that you're that you're putting together now? Um, and, and what are you doing to help women take the lead in such a difficult uh, industry? Um, hi there, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me uh, talking, uh, among others, about the initiative that our uh, entire uh, global top leadership justice signed. It's called Jamais Sans Elle, so translated to Never Without Her. It's an initiative that uh, contains three major commitments. So the first one is that every um, executive leader um, has committed him or herself uh, no longer to participate in any public or internal event, really regardless of the topic, if there's no women among multiple speakers. The second commitment is that our very own communication has to be uh, or has to make diversity more visible uh, throughout the whole uh, press and also communication folio. And the third part is that we have committed ourselves uh, for mandatory targets so that we want to reach at least 40% women in senior management positions and at least 30% in our executive committee by 2025. And as you said, it's a kind of male-dominated um, industry, so this is a bold move. And coming back to the second part of your question, I don't see it that um, something that women have to be up there alone to take the lead on this. It's really not about fixing the women. It's about fixing the organization by making sure that we really let different talent sit at the table. So it ultimately really leads to this greater representation of women by breaking this vicious circle know who you can be by the people you see. And we all know this problem if we only ask men for their expertise in public discussions and invite them to panels, manals, um, the image persists that there really are no women for top leadership positions. And this initiative, Jamais Sans Elle, has changed the argumentation. Mm -hmm. So it's not women anymore who have to claim for their equal rights to be considered as experts, but those who organize events have to make sure that their panels are diverse. 
So it's a great example, I think, of how organization can change and also this mindset change can um, be approached. And I invite you all to copy and paste uh, this idea and to use it for your own purposes. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Eva. Well, let, let's see about how, how replicating that uh, in, in Japan. So uh, let's turn to, to Akira. And should I say congrats on the on the win at the Masters yesterday? You know, proud day for, for, for Japan. Um, let's talk about the cultural challenges, to be fair, uh, in, in Japan. You know, the difficulties that you experience and what's being done in terms of what you see for women putting themselves forwards, you know, for the top jobs at Japan Airlines, you know, could be as pilots or, or executives. Uh, yes, you're right that, that there are indeed a lot of cultural challenges here in Japan, um, but I think it's not unique to Japan. I think many countries have um, to, to some extent their cultural challenges. And we've in Japan Airlines for the past six, seven years, I've been using our sort of formal um, DNI platform, which you call uh, the JAL DNI Lab, to bring together staff from different departments, cabin crews, house office. Um, airport ground staff, head office departments, just to meet regularly to first discuss openly um, DNI issues and challenge a lot of cultural um, mindset that we ha we've had in the past and to understand barriers such as um, career interruption of our female staffs, um, what experience whenever there is a life event such as marriage, childbirth, um, nursing elderly parents, psychological barriers in a very male-centric so seniority-based environment that makes it very hard to speak up. Many female staff, although they want to have a sense of fulfillment from work, that they do not want to advance to senior positions because there is no role model. Um, I think um, Billie Jean and King mentioned that a little bit at her opening um, remarks. And hence, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. So we started by making recommendations to implement changes. Uh, we've implemented new PR policies um, that challenges a lot of old social norms. Um, for example, allowing female staff to balance responsibilities, understanding that there are responsibilities both at home and at work um, by having flexible working hours and having compressed week. Uh, and parental leave uh, for both male and female parents and so forth. And thirdly, really to generate more awareness through advocacy, training and support to change mindsets so that DNI becomes not just someone else's agenda, but my personal agenda. And uh, to, to the cultural challenge, I think it's just really a matter of changing mindsets. We actually did a survey on 2000 employees and we asked, you are a family of four. Uh, you, your spouse, and two children, and you're giving your dream position as an expat abroad. But your spouse was also offered promotion. What do you do? I mean, in in sort of non-Japanese societies, respondents would be sort of roughly all thirty percent would say that well, I would give up my 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 um, expat position um, and, and, and let and let's see what happens. But in Japan, sixty four percent of female respondents in our company replied that they they would give up that that dream position, while only 30% of male responses like that they would get because it's just unthinkable in the minds of many Japanese mm -hmm. men to sacrifice mm -hmm. one's career. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to work a lot in changing mindsets by paying attention to what we have been trained to ignore or place outside mm -hmm. our vision and, and by recognizing the myths that are outside our personal agenda. Great. Um, th thanks, Akira. So, so a lot of similarities there you know, between what Eva and Akira is saying, really just reflecting and um, changing mindsets and the importance of, of moving in, into that space. So let's, you know, a, a culture, a culture and mindsets are one thing, but let's let's pick up on what Billie Jean talked about, about the more commercial aspects of, of, of changing the system and I guess the price tag that, that's attached to that. So Angela, if I, if I may look at you, because you've done a huge amount of work at the Sports Innovation Lab, um, where you've been focusing on the fans. Now the fans is, is an area that maybe isn't quite so um, focused on in, in, in this world to one extent. So because the inequality of investment and media coverage and broadcasting rights and prize money is catch-22 situation, how do you think and how, have your, how has your research found that, that, that stakeholders should maybe address this inequality by, by considering the fan perspective more than they, they could or should at the moment? Yeah, thank you, Noala. Um, we're, so we're a market research company, and I've been obsessed with this conversation for many years. How do we get more investment in women's sports? Um, one thing that's really interesting, if you look uh, core to our research, we talk about the fluid fan, the future fan. 
uh, because of the digital transformation of the sports industry as a whole, every single business, international federation, national Olympic committees had to think, rethink the rules of how they drive engagement. We hear this word engagement over and over. And we all know, again, the professionals tend to put more investment are focused on the fan than the federations typically, you know, we have a lot of governance and politics. Um, but needless to say, every international federation property that's thinking about um, the commercial aspect, the growth opportunity for, for their sport, which drives revenue either into the pockets of the owners or into the pockets of obviously all the, the member federations has to be thinking about from a fan perspective now. The old ways of doing business where you just make money off of you know sponsorship and ticketing, we think now is a moment in time where all of those rules are changing and actually the best moment in time now for women's sports. So let me explain, we're doing a big um, research project called the Fan Project. If you look up the fanproject.co, we wanna create data-driven research paper that talks about the business opportunity of women's sports. So that 4% number that Billy referenced earlier in the conversation, we are in a chicken and egg cycle, but that relies on linear viewership. And we think women sports fans are very unique because they're actually more digitally savvy, not because they're just more technologically advanced, but out of necessity, they have to be creative in creating communities online or using uh, their behaviors are actually very focused or forward. So the fanproject.co is looking at can we measure those new consumption patterns, those new fan behaviors? They're all about this future fan, this fluid fan, but we think women's sports uniquely is an advantage because they're, these fans are, are, are more nimble. They're, they're open to change. They're, they're, they're digitally savvy. They're doing things that, that men's fans can lean back, watch on TV. They just click and there's a million options for them. Again, women fans have to be more uh, nimble. And, those stakeholders that understand this massive shift in the market overall are already investing in these platforms and these technologies. But if you then drill down another layer, which is what we're looking at at the fan project, it's actually quite interesting because women sports fans out of necessity are this future fan. And that is a massive opportunity. So from a business perspective, a commercial lens, don't, Billy talked about the history and tradition of you know, years of investment in a property there's a reason men's sports properties are, are winning. They've had, and we're saying don't lift it and shift it, shrink it and pink it, right? Under invest, you're not gonna win. What we're saying is no, actually think about women's sports as a new market, a new opportunity that I think could frog a lot of the traditional men's properties that don't actually think this way. So we're out to prove the business case, the data, and I 100% believe in Billy's point of, Show me the money and the money is there. We just haven't been looking at the right things. We've been looking at the linear, which has historically had a tremendous amount of bias in the system. So the rules are changing. I'm very excited about that. And again, if we're forward thinking, it isn't just the right thing to do to invest in women's sports. There's actually a massive business case for it. Okay, great. Well, well, let's take a few from, from, from some others on the panel about that because obviously, in, you know, investment investment in fans uh, and technology is a is a pretty expensive thing. But if it can help increase the value, whether actual or perceived, it's obviously a good thing. Kelly, what do you think about that? I mean, obviously, the ITF has been investing significantly um, in technology so far. But what do you think in terms of future state? What else can be done? You know, picking up on on what Angela's just talked about. Yeah, I agree completely. I think, you know, technology is so important and depends on virtually everything we do. So, you know, digital transformation is at the heart of our strategy too. And we've got a couple of things that, that are at the heart of our of our current focus. One is data, no surprise there. And the other one's virtual sports. So so sometimes we 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 signed Microsoft as a Billie Jean King Cup sponsor and and you know they've invested in tennis for the first time. So we, we're launching the, the Microsoft Play Analytics platform with data with data visualization that I think will you know transform the coaching, the play performance, as well as the fan experience in the Billie Jean King Cup um, this year. And importantly, we're not just introducing new technology. We're finding ways to integrate, integrate them to create new platforms that enhance the game. And as Angela pointed out, you know, the fan experience. So we're not only looking at the traditional game, but also new ways, such as virtual sports. So this weekend, as part of the, the Billie Jean King Cup um, playoffs, 
we're launching the Ten Flash mobile game. Um, and and, and it, for us, that's so exciting to explore new realms and boldly go where, where we haven't gone before. This is this hasn't even been launched at the Davis Cup. So it's a real it's a real first out there and we, we're really looking forward to that. Super. Well, investments can come from many areas, as we know, and one, of course, is, is, is government. Uh, Kirsty, as, a, as, a, as an MP in Zimbabwe, you have a front row seat about how governments can help amplify this message and very deep pockets. Is there an opportunity, do you think, for different sports to partner more and better and more strategically, maybe, um, with the different government bodies? Uh, yeah, Nula, thanks. I mean, I think governments are just a part of the bigger equation. You have UN agencies, you have your big NGOs, and all of them, including governments and sports organizations, are all in the drive and the push for um, this inclusivity and gender equity. Um, and I think when, it, when you're looking at Nelson specifically in, in Zimbabwe, where, um, as, as we heard, um, earlier with with japan we're, we're quite similar uh cultures in where uh women we have to be quite purposeful still in terms of numbers of women or female representatives that we have whether it's in our parliament or um within government as ministers etc but i don't see that as a bad thing so i think that there are very good organizations and world organizations leaders the un um i mean you represent uh, the un and you know the push that the un are having and the un play huge um roles in development countries um in terms of the leadership so i think with organizations such as the IOC and the UN and governments, um, they need to continue this leadership role and this push role, and they need to continue to be purposeful in the decisions that they're making in terms of gender equity and equality. Um, speaking from a, a, an African country, it's not something that just comes as easy. Um, mm -hmm. it's still, you know, and it was really touching from what Billy was saying is that we never know who's going to listen to us talk and who it might inspire and and get you know some momentum going. And that's so so true because we very much are still trying to change that cultural stigma of girls aren't as good and girls should just go to get an education and they shouldn't be playing sport because they need to be home looking after family. Um, so yes, you mentioned deep pockets that some governments have, but other governments um, in terms of mine, sport is very important, but there's still always a push and pull between education or sport. Education for all, or sport for a few. So there is many sort of lines um, which all need to start working together and, and sport and education is one in which to change, I think, these cultural, um, what come cultural norms and, and cultural ways of thinking to allow for there to be platforms for these different organizations to come together and purposefully work on making sure and ensuring that women's sport and female leadership is at the top of their priority. Super. And again, if we can flick back to, to, to Japan, um, Akira, based on, on what we've just heard from Kirsty, um, and you represent Japan Airlines, what strategic role do you think that organizations like Japan Airlines, but not necessarily like, like them, in general can, can, can play in changing perceptions beyond just employment and um, sponsorship and, invest, and from an investment perspective? I, I think we really, really need to looking at um, why do sports sponsorship, obviously um, in the past it's very much about um, return on ad spend, getting more eyeball, eyeballs on your brand and all that. But I think it, it's time to really focus on that agenda, but also look at uh, the purpose of sponsorship, the, the, the values we want to uphold, the, the values we want uh, and are the things we want to really um, um, use sort of sponsorship in, in a new way. And I think the, the 19 pandemic has made this awareness um, all the more acute. And we hear more and more companies speak a book title to put in purpose in the practice. And it says it is a sense of purpose that transcends self-interest, a sense of purpose that speaks to develop reciprocally beneficial obligations among a wide variety of relevant stakeholders 
performance for the benefit of people, planet, and profit. And it goes on even saying that the purpose of business is to produce profitable solutions to problems of people and planet, and not to profit from producing problems for people and planet. I think corporations have to play um, in creating and enforcing through allyship the social norms of um, mutuality, of, of interlocking interests, of balanced re reciprocity, network of well-being in our societies. And I think this is the new angle and new life that we need. Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Akira. And let, let, let's change tack just a little. Given that we have some um, psychology experts uh, on the panel, it would be remiss of me not to, to at least probe in, in, to get inside the changing mind of, of, of individuals in this space. So the essence of business and sport is clearly competition. And competition, as we all know, can be very healthy or very unhealthy, particularly if it's at an individual level. So, Eva, uh, in your experience, um, how can we use the name competition itself to move forward on this agenda? Uh, well, I think it's the first thing when it comes to competition is you make your progress transparent. I think this helps everyone to see where do we stand, where do we have some, uh, well, some uh, open issues to to deal with and of of course it's a competitive advantage when you leverage diversity within your organization and when you attract and also retain talents mm -hmm. that uh, might still be out there so there are tons of research already showing what also angela mentioned earlier that there is not only a human case, that it's not only fair and the right thing to do, but that is also a business imperative to focus on getting diversity into your either boardroom or in every other room where people are coming together, um, thinking about new mm -hmm. products, about new services. And there are some figures I, I like to share with you. For example, um, when you have a more diverse uh, workforce, you can increase your innovation by 30%. And you can also decrease, and this is, I think, uh, important also in times of crisis, like uh, with the pandemic right now, you can decrease your mm -hmm. risk by 20%. You will be more uh, innovative and more agile with a cognitive, diverse, and culturally inclusive team six times compared to companies who are not that diverse. And you are eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. So there is an advantage. And I think the competition helps really to um, to talk about gender equality, not in terms of um, discrimination and uh, singled out uh, minority groups, but really tackling the workplace inequality uh, from a more strategic and also from a more systemic approach because then you show also your future talent and also those who want to retain that you see them not only as workers, but with the whole potential they are bringing to work. And I think this will help all of us to thrive if more companies, more organizations practice DNI in a more strategic and also holistic approach. Very good. If anyone else on the panel has any views, uh, feel free to, to, to add in, in accordingly on that particular topic. I see no takers for that one. I'll be I'll be back. Well, let continue with, with competition, um, Eva. And speaking of competition, many of the, the clients that I work with, and a lot of them are male CEOs, talk about the lack of female role models or talent um, as a challenge. And but some also refer to other women um, as being unhelpful. Now, we had Lindsay Davenport, I think, who, who, you know, said in tennis, she was very fortunate, a lot of very, very you know, positive experiences. Kirsty, from your perspective and indeed anyone else's uh, to start with, how supportive do you think women uh, are in sports to each other? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, over the last month, I've been doing a lot of these uh, conversations because it's we've been celebrating Women's uh, Day and month. Um, and this question actually came up a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nula. Um, you know, I, I think that there are women who are genuine in supporting other women. 
And I think that there are women who get to a point after fighting for so long and so hard to get into a position and a role that with the ever changing of technology and the increase in transparency and good governance, the time that they then spend in those leadership roles are getting shorter and shorter. And that's where I've seen women not be super supportive of other women because they have feel that they've only just got to this leadership role and they've only just sort of making an impression and changing things mm -hmm. and they're not yet ready to hand it over. And it, I don't think that it's a personal thing. I don't think that it's because they, they don't see talent or a future in other women. I think that they have just had to fight so hard to get to be heard and to be seen mm -hmm. and to get that recognition that now um, the way the world is and the the um, legislation even being put into place, whether it's governments or sports organizations around length of terms, um, at some point those terms are getting shorter and shorter. And unfortunately for women, we're, we're getting to, to the good parts and to the leadership right as all those rules are being changed. So our time at the top is somewhat limited. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, I've, I've very much come across very genuine women who have been very supportive to me and very helpful to me along my journey. So I must agree with you. I've not come across uh, a woman who has tried to derail um, what I've tried to achieve. Maybe I, I didn't know. Maybe uh, they did it behind the scenes, but nothing to, to my face that I can really see. But I have seen it been done to friends or, or to other, mm -hmm. other women in organizations, especially in the sports world, who just aren't really given the value. And if they are going up against a male counterpart for a leadership role, there is generally not a lot of female support because mm -hmm. they tend, especially in a, in a country, in a region like Southern Africa or Africa, where women leadership is still taking its time to catch on um, a lot of women that are up and coming will then support the male candidate over the female just in case that female loses you know they don't want to rock the boat so we also need to learn just to be brave um, mm -hmm. and, and and be able to follow what Billie Jean was saying you know stand up and fight and, and be ready to be uncomfortable they're, they're great points Kirsty and um and as a behavioral scientist, I, I, I'm often struck by the unconscious self-sabotage that women do to themselves. So it's one thing to have someone do it to you. It's another thing what you might actually do to yourself. Um, so, so on that line of thought, what more, and I'd be interested in a male and a female perspective here. So what more can women do to help themselves? Uh, let's start with Angela and then I'll take you from, from Kelly, if I may. Yeah, really interesting question. Um, I think it goes back to the point, again, Billy made about uh, getting hired uh, for potential for men versus experience for women and how much that has been uh, internalized for women. I hear a lot of the idea of the imposter syndrome. Oh, I shouldn't be in the room or I'm not an expert. Men tend to not have that. If, even if they have an inkling of experience, they put their name forward, put their name forward for jobs um, or new, uh, new roles within a company. So. I would say we should be more introspective and say, hire, hire yourself on your potential. Put your hand up on your potential. Don't feel like you have to have every single piece of the puzzle figured out before, again, nominating yourself or feeling you're confident enough uh, to take on a new role. Um, and and stay true to who you are. I mean, I, my one of the best moments that happened in my life, I was cut from a hockey team because I was a girl when I was nine years old. And uh, and everyone told me I shouldn't play a male dominated sport. There wasn't in the Olympics at the time. And, and I had great family around me. I loved the sport. I wanted to play and I, and I kept going forward, forward. I, I pushed through the, um, the gender, um, you know, bias that I was seeing and the discrimination. Um, but then I was aware, it was eyes wide open throughout my whole career. Okay. You're going to get called names, maybe get cut from teams, but I loved it. I stayed true to who I was and ended up being a four-time Olympian as a result. So I my advice to women would be stay true. To you are find your passion. You're going to work. You're going to hustle the guy next to you or, the, or the, even the woman next to you, anyone, if you love what you're doing. Um, but don't limit yourself. Right. Um, you know, the, my favorite quote, if you think you can, or you can't, you're probably right. 
-hmm. and record. Tell tell yourself you can. Convince yourself you can. Don't don't believe in yourself at the end of the day because mm -hmm. again, every woman has potential. Mm -hmm. Maybe you haven't been told it enough in your career. Maybe society hasn't rewarded you. But we're all amazing people. And don't even with all the bias in the current structures, there's great people like on this conference that are trying to change it or trying to do the right thing, little steps at a time, but don't be self-limiting and, and even yourself at the end of the day, um, uh, hire yourself on potential. That's it. That, uh, great advice, Angela, hire yourself. And so Kelly, from a male perspective, from you've seen women, you know, maybe self-sabotaging, maybe not, maybe hiring themselves, maybe not. What would you say that you think that women um, could or should do, should do differently to help themselves, you know, get, promote themselves more? Yeah, it was interesting. We recently had a webinar on, on this theme. What, you know, what makes a great leader uh, with, a, with a great bunch of, of, of panelists like we have today, men and women. And, and I think there was some, a number of themes that come out, which, you know, continue to come out today. But I think the, you know, the self-belief, the self-confidence, um, mm -hmm being comfortable outside your comfort zone. I tell my children that all the time. Um, I think one thing that comes out very strongly is the importance of building a network. You know, men are probably better than that that, that mm -hmm. at women. And, and, and I think maybe that's changing now, but you know, we spoke about this, the need to, 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 you know, surround yourself by being championed by men and the need to be supported by other women. So, so I think you know the need also for mentors and sponsors. The, 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 those are, I, I think, are, are all kind of common themes that will 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 help women um, to help themselves. Yeah, it's a great point, and I suspect um, Akira, you want to come in on this one uh, in terms of Japan and the, and male allyship there. Now, I mean notwithstanding the fact that it was obviously unhelpful from the he head of the Tokyo Olympic Committee to make the comments that were made of late. Uh, I don't know if that helps or hinders the situation you know, for male allyship in Japan. Um, but what support are you seeing um, and getting, I should say rather, in, in Japan, either from the organization or, or more broadly from, from, from your peers? Yes, I, I think the very inappropriate comments made by um, our, our minister and also the, the people who have um, the committee um, has sparked a lot of um, conversation in Japan, uh, which I think in the end actually um, worked towards uh, more um, diversity and inclusion and um, because it really raised awareness about and, and, and prompted us to ask questions as to why is this happening in Japan? This is a huge embarrassment and it's definitely not acceptable socially. Um, and I, I think we in Japan now, so we are rather fortunate um, to, to have our allyship. Of course, to begin with, um, our president um, himself has been very supportive um, in our commitment to address gender inequality. Uh, we also include men in our DNI lab activities because we find it very important to have this seen from the perspectives of both genders so that we notice um, the kind of biases that we have. Um, and there is also a growing awareness thanks to NPOs such as the Japan Women's Innovative Network uh, encourages company to establish um, concrete goals and create social and economic impact through gender equality. Um, so I think um, at the beginning of the journey, it is beginning Oops. to grow. Great, great. And actually, on, on that point, Eva, just, just very briefly uh, from you, maybe, we've talked today about a lot of different strategies. You know, we've had, we've had networks, male allyship, quotas, and um, role models. In your experience, to what extent do you think these are, that these are seen as quick wins um, or wishful thinking? Do you think if beyond those tactics and those initiatives, and they're all very important in their own right, is do you, do you think that they are effective? And if not, what else do you think could or should be done? Well, for me, it's always important to have a holistic approach. I mean, it's not enough to have an individual mentor or these kind of women's networks. Uh, we have seen these programs for the last 30 to 40 years and didn't change the organization. And um, as I said, and I also um, shared some links on, on, on research on it, I like to base my work on, on evidence. And one of the most compelling research that I've 
used in the past is from Michelle Penelope King and her work. She introduced the 4P of inequality, and this means uh, tackling processes, policies, practices, and personal beliefs. So when we talk about processes, we have to review the whole employee life cycle, starting from our recruitment practices, looking at succession planning, benefits and rewards. So we will find a lot of systemic biases there. The same is for policies. So all the written rules within a company, like guidelines uh, on sexual harassment, flexibility arrangements, parental leave, if any, and this is mainly the focus of HR pre uh, processes and so uh, policies and uh, HR and uh, its stakeholders. And when it comes to practices and also this personal beliefs, it's everyone's job. It's um, also a leader's job to um, review your own people decisions, to speak and confront misbehavior, to deal with differences, knowing your personal preferences, your own biases, your assumptions. And we have to do it, all these four pillars, in parallel to shape the culture. And it takes, I would say, six to eight years. There's literally no real quick win just to announce your commitment for DNI. So it's really more a marathon, and you have to work on it day by day. Well, the thing is how I have technologists there. I see a, 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 a question coming in here, just a quick one for you. Um, confidence often talked about as one of the major reasons why women don't put themselves forward etc any thoughts and that's from uh, Gronje O'Neill uh, any advice of what national associations or I guess we could extend that to organizations can do in terms of helping women um, you know either return to play in this case or, or put themselves forward well there again it's not about you know make being more confident as a woman it's really uh, having a better uh, understanding of confidence versus competence. And it's about the systems that uh, reproduce uh, the ideal worker who is more confident than competent. Um, there's also a great article uh, from a male researcher and he asked some years ago, why are there so many incompetent men leaders? And it's, he says it's a uh, difference getting the job because you are confident, you are showing off, you're visible. But being a leader means something completely different. Being behind your team, making others um, shine with their work. Uh, so I, I, I really resist the idea to you know, fix again the women, uh, making them fit into some workplace that is not designed for differences instead of looking at this design and looking at the processes and also the policies that uh, are not only hindering women and uh, are not only, um, uh, well, preventing women uh, to mm -hmm. advance, but also men and, and also those who are not this ideal type of men. And I think this will advance our uh, equality uh, discussions much more, though, again, focusing on training, coaching uh, women individually. Very good, thanks. And and actually, for, for our last section now, I, I want to turn just very briefly to, I guess, the area of, of leadership. So we've touched on it in, in, in and, you know, I think all was made by Billie Jean, but also it's, it's been made by, by world leaders and many other people. And I'm going to combine this question uh, with the question that's come in from Katrina Gala. So um, given all these shifts uh, and, you know, business leaders have the power, as Billie Jean said, Kelly, if I might just ask you this one. Um, do you think, and anyone can answer, but do you think that there is a different type of leadership required? I did a session recently in the Financial Services Forum, and again, it was very interesting, an area that's been completely disrupted, not by this topic, but in general by technology. And it's very interesting to see how, how people who have held really high, strong leadership positions um, are answering this question. So, Kelly, to you, do you think that, a, one, do you think that there is a new type of leadership required? And I don't mean male or male, but a different way of thinking. And Katrina's question is, within that, what do you think are the best ways to put strategic pressure on organisations to make this shift happen? Well, I mean, the answer to your question, I think, is absolutely. There's, there's, mm. there's a new type of leader. And I think, in particular, today, you know, what we're going through is that greater agility in leadership is absolutely essential. I mean, we see 
we see the imperative now to be informed by data and research. We, you know, to monitor industry trends, how technology is involved, evolving, how, you know, people are viewing sport, how consumers are interacting with our game. The only thing that constant today is change and, and the federation model has to adapt to the evolving needs and the expectations of its athletes and its consumers. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, it's adapt or die. Um, there's no, there's no doubt about it, and and we're seeing that all the time. And and in terms of the the, the putting pressure, any ideas in terms of how um, people people can put more pressure on the organisations to make the change? Yeah, maybe from other industries. Something you might have seen from other industries. Nothing, nothing comes to mind. But I, I think, I mean, you know, I, I just think if if you're not changing, you're going to be left behind today in yeah. today's world. You know, the things are moving so fast, and into and and you know, by doing nothing, you're actually going backwards. So if if you're not if you're not you know thinking ahead and mm. moving forward, um, I think your sport and your federation is going to be the loser. So it's it's really up to the leaders to to make sure that that doesn't happen. Mm. And, and, and Kirsty, in, in your in your role, you must have exposure to all of the industries um, in Zimbabwe, but also, I guess, I guess internationally as well. But it gives you a very good platform and a very good, a very good eye for seeing what can be learned maybe from across different industries in this space. Anything that you'd like to share, I guess, with the audience today? Um, Nula, I mean, I think it's really all just about, and I think I've said this a couple times, but I think it's just about being purposeful and making the decision to make this a priority um, and once that's done it will become natural as we progress and as we go on but um, I think some industries are doing a much better job than others um, and I think it was Eva that was saying you know things like this don't just happen overnight it takes time um, as much as it can be patience and us wanting things to move uh, quicker um, but it is really just about being purposeful and, and, and really committing to making those decisions on, on gender equity and equality. Great. Um, all right, I see some questions coming in now. Let me see. Who can get the hot seat for this one? Uh, Jay. Okay. Jay, you're asking about, Jay from iSport Connect, um, you're asking about childcare. Uh, an obstacle for women. How can organisations help ease the burden and help women take on new commitments? Well, Akira, let me ask you about that one, as opposed to asking a woman. Let me ask an evolved, modern man. I think the important thing is just to understand that, um, as for example, in our company, we have a lot of female colleagues who have to take on very heavy responsibilities in the work and when they uh, arrive home in the eve late very often very late in the evening they have responsibilities at home so i think the important thing is to not ignore or to to not overlook um, these needs and and to really um see how we can support and help uh, our female workers so we have introduced a lot of new hr policies but i don't think that alone is enough um for example most of our female colleagues would say that they have um to take care of elderly parents and um, only 20% replied that they were able to continue their work. Most believe that they will have to, one way or another, um, forfeit their the, the jobs uh, in order to take care of a member of the family. But yet only 10% who have um, had experience of, of taking care of, of families are using um, the company's um, um, system, uh, it's, it's a support system essentially, um, and and we, we just ask why I mean, we have the policies ready we have everything ready why are people not using it and i think this boils down to to really a lack of sort of awareness um and very, very often i think people feel that okay we have we've done our job we have provided all these policies and um um yeah the rest is up to you everything is fine but that's not fine because we need to mm -hmm create awareness we need to remove a lot of psychological barriers uh, that people are feeling and in order to do that we need to really sit down together and have conversation and understand uh, what those psychological barriers are 
Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, for one more question, uh, just before just before we, we wrap up with, with the panel's last question. And it was a question that came in earlier. I'm not sure if it's still there. It was a question around, and, and, and Angela, maybe this one's for you. Uh, it was a question around whether you you thought that um or you think that the that having joint events more joint events more male and female events would help shift and, and make a difference in this space and i know some sports are but just having more of them well i think the uh you look at the olympic games has had you know just a case in point um because the women's sports have in some ways been bundled with men's sports has benefited from the investment through time now it's one of the largest brands in the world, but I don't think it's necessary. I think in ways it could help if you're talking about the scalability and, and shared services across an event, you know, think, think Wimbledon, think some of these major events where you can essentially bring crowds together with ease. Uh, but I don't want to do a disservice to women's sports. I do think women's sports can and should stand alone a lot in a lot of cases. Uh, again, there's a tremendous amount of, of data that exists now to say that uh, from an asset class, women's sports is more like a new um, a new investment where you're going to have a lot, of, you know, years in the red. But when you come out of that, your return on investment is going to be much higher than maybe male sports, which we see here in the U.S. Take professional men's sports as an example. That asset class might be growing year over year of 10 to 15 percent. So women's sports, I believe, can stand on their own, but it requires a strong leader with deep enough pockets to say, look, we're going to invest and put the same amount of capital and investment we would in a new professional men's sport. Because Billy's earlier point, men's sports took decades to where they are. So if you think about it from that perspective, better ROI in women's sports, why you see a lot of private equity coming in and thinking about investing, not just in men, but in women. Um, so I don't want to say it's a bad value proposition to bundle them. In some cases, it's really smart because you could you could invest in marketing and some of the things that maybe women get underinvested. You could put them under one umbrella. But I think in terms of you're starting a new sport or you have a current women's only sport, don't think you have to bundle them with the men to be successful. Uh, this new age consumer, this new fan, they're they're woke, as we say. They're look, they are gender blind in a lot of cases. They just want great athletes with great stories on the platforms that they care about. And they'll take a great product. They don't have to be beholden to the old guard, the old way of thinking. And so a lot of change is happening now. In some cases, yes, it makes sense to answer your question. But I think in a lot of cases, it isn't necessary. And, and in some ways, I would personally rather invest in the women's game than the men right now. Great, great, great answer. Um, a venture capitalist mindset, I think, is also what you can take out of that. So uh, final question for the panel. Uh, you've got 30 seconds max. Um, as we've a lot to get through today so the question is and you've all kind of given different pieces of advice throughout today i think but really in terms of the, the the people listening to this what advice would you give any women aspiring to a leadership position either in sport or in business you know on the field or off the, the field so the advice that you would give them based on your years of expertise let's start with kirsty Kirsty, your mic, you're on mute. That, okay, that's cut in my 30 seconds on top Good of girl. that. <laughs> um, so Nula, I, I mean, I think my advice is that nothing good or worthwhile comes right away it's not going to happen overnight so keep pushing keep raising the bar and keeping cre and keep creating uh, platforms to, to grow and help each other through this. Terrific, patience and platforms. Um, Akira? Yes, uh, my advice would be um, have confidence and be an advocate yourself so the woman will see and be encouraged. And there are many people willing to support you. Superb. Angela? Um, I mean, I've said a, a lot, I think, in terms of a women's perspective. I would say for the men out there, that we're looking to you. You're you're in the seat of power. Um, you know, before we get to that equal society, I would just encourage all the men out there that have this much influence to use that and think about not just women, but all underserved communities that haven't had the same opportunity. Um, you're going to create a better world. So I would just be a lot of advice to women directly, but to men who are in charge of the systems, think about the little things you can do. To Very good. 
Uh, Anjiva? Actually, I have uh, two great quotes from two great women. So the first would be from Madeleine Albright, the former uh, US foreign minister. And she once said, there is a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. So this would reflect also our discussion earlier. And the second one, I would go with um, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris and say, why well, don't be afraid to be the first one? Um, because this will be the case in many leadership positions, but make sure you are not the last. Fantastic. Uh, and Kelly? So two things. Yeah, I, I'd say yeah, um, encourage people to, to say yes to the opportunity, you know, embrace the challenge and confident in your ability. And secondly, um, a little punt here. It's possible to learn, earn a living, as Billy says, follow the money on and off the court in tennis. Roles in management, media, coaching and officiating are hugely, hugely rewarding career. Go for it. Fantastic. Superb advice, a fascinating discussion and one that will continue in many organizations going forward, I suspect. So Kirsty, Kelly, Akira, Angela and Eva, let me close this panel. And on behalf of myself, the ITF and iSport Connect, a huge thanks to each one of you for your contribution and your candor. So thank you all very much. Back to you, Catherine. Thanks, Nula. Yeah, and I'd like to extend my thanks to her as well. What a fantastic panel. Thank you to all of your contributions from those panellists. A really enlightening debate. I've learned a lot there and it was a privilege to listen to. So thank you to everyone involved. We've got one more panel. Uh, it's coming up in about 15 minutes less. Uh, so we'll be taking a short break until then. In that time, um, I'd invite you to make use of our breakout sessions, as I discussed earlier, to have follow up discussions on anything you've heard so far to join a table. You just click on one of the virtual chairs to enter. You'll be able to see all of the delegates from the table. And uh, we do encourage you to keep your cameras on for the conversation if you can. You can join and leave any table at any time. And most tables will have an iSport Connect or ITF representative present. Don't worry, you'll be automatically brought back in for our second panel at around about 3.55 UK time. That's the See It To Be It panel. So we'll see you back here in 15 minutes time.